Hello, my name is Deborah Lovelock and I'm the Development Director at St. Catherine's College. Thank you for joining us today. Today is our final Cats Chats event in this series of virtual gatherings. I would like to introduce today's speakers. We have Professor of Economic Geography, Professor Ron Martin, the Cousins Fellow and University Reader in Geography, Dr. Ian Willis, and the McGrath College Lecturer in Geography and Admissions Tutor, Dr. Ivan Scales. They will be discussing geography at St. Catharines. So without any further delay, I'm delighted to hand you over to Professor Ron Martin. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this Geography Cats Chat. Whether you read Geography at Cats or some other subject, we hope you will find this short webinar about the importance of geography as a subject and the leading role that St. Cats plays in the teaching and research of geography at Cambridge, both informative and stimulating. By way of a little bit of context, the study of geography at Cambridge has its roots in the late 19th century. And today, the Cambridge department is consistently ranked as one of the best, not just in the UK, but internationally. And since the early decades of the 20th century, CATS has occupied a preeminent position in the development of the discipline here at Cambridge and is widely known as the college they wish to study the subject. The college is one of the largest cohorts of geography undergraduates. It regularly dominates the top of the tripos lists and has produced generations of graduates who have moved into prominent positions in a vast range of occupations and employments from journalism to industry, the civil service, to NGOs, banking and finance, various public services, and also in teaching. It's also trained a host of academic geographers who have themselves gone on to hold positions and professorships, not just here in Cambridge, but worldwide. And CATS also has the largest single number of geography fellows of any college, not just in Cambridge, <coughs> but also Oxford who are fellows of the British Academy. So in more ways than one, CATS really is the place to come and study geography. And what about geography today? Geography has always been of importance for understanding how economies grow and develop, how societies evolve, and importantly, how we interact with our natural environment. But in recent decades, the critical importance of geography, of place, of location, has risen to the top of scientific, political, and policy agendas everywhere. At a time when we confront a cascade of crises, climate change, of course, environmental and ecosystem degradation, entrenched problems of socioeconomic inequality, and now, of course, the global COVID pandemic, arguably, geography has never been so important. I remember the late comedian, Spike Milligan, once quipped that everyone has to be somewhere and every somewhere matters. We would express the same sentiment today by arguing that place matters. People make places, but places shape people. Perhaps more than that, in our hyper-connected global world, what happens in one place can have profound implications for what happens in other places. Geography really matters. The three of us here today have different research interests and we're actively involved in researching and informing this heightened scientific and policy relevance of geography today. We hope you enjoy our short, necessarily selective chats about some of our research, and we hope we cover some of the questions that have been sent in in so doing. So can I first of all hand over to Ian, who is our physical geographer and is going to talk about some of his research. Great. Thank you very much, Ron um, and Deborah, before you. And hello, everybody. Um, now, I'm hoping that uh, everyone can see um, the slides here. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Hannah to move on to my first slide. That's a broad... Yeah, a broad title. I'm going to be talking about sort of climate change, uh, particularly in polar regions. And uh, this really... This, this first graphic here is... Uh, 
you've probably seen this or versions of it before, but this is really the backdrop against which a lot of physical geography um, is, and indeed geography, is, is done nowadays. It just is charting the uh, global warming uh, that's occurred since the 1880s. Um, global temperatures have risen by around one degree Celsius, it's about two degrees um, Fahrenheit, and two thirds of that warming globally has occurred since uh, 1975. Um, what this graphic really shows is that uh, there's an amplification of that warming in particular regions. And so a lot of warming greater than average in the Arctic, um, but also you can see down the bottom around the Antarctic Peninsula, just see it there, um, and also areas of Europe, the Middle East and um, Asia. Um, so, of course, this warming has caused sea levels to rise. And again, this is one of the big backdrops against which my work um, is done. Uh, we can see that uh, since uh, 1993, now that's pretty much when I arrived at the department as a, as a lecturer and when I joined the college as a, as a fellow. So basically, in the time that I have been uh, an academic here at Cambridge, sea level has risen globally by around nine centimetres, which I always think is quite shocking. Um, and... Uh, you, we can see that a lot of that is some of that is due to thermal expansion, just the, 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 the waters warming, but um, even more is associated with water being added from the cryosphere, from the icy world um, into, the, into the oceans. Uh, and so the combination of that thermal expansion and the adding of meltwater uh, has contributed to the, to the overall sea level rise. Around five centimetres of that sea level rise since 1993 has been due to meltwater. And these are ballpark figures, but around two and a half centimetres of that is from the world's glaciers. Uh, around two centimetres is from Greenland. And around half a centimetre so far has been from the Antarctic ice sheet. And a lot of that is from West Antarctica, particularly uh, the peninsula. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing, both on the Greenland ice sheet um, on Antarctic ice shelves, um, and also in the so-called third pole um, in high mountain Asia, and particularly in, in Nepal. So first off, the Greenland uh, ice sheet. Uh, now, the, a lot of my work is associated with um, hydrology, the water. How is water produced? How does it move? And what happens to it uh, within the gl glaciers, ice sheets, and uh, on ice shelves? I do other things as well in terms of my research, but I'm going to focus on the, on the hydrology. And in terms of the Greenland hydrology, you can see a cartoon there in the top left that's uh, showing you um, that water is produced on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. It penetrates through up to the bed around the margins, and then it eventually flows across the bed and, and emerges at the front of the ice sheet. And, and hydrology is important on the Greenland ice sheet because the amount of water getting to the bed, the pressures that it creates there, affects how fast the glaciers move. Um, and so this is really important in trying to understand the sensitivity of glaciers to, to climate change. Um, a couple of uh, photographs in the bottom left-hand corner. We can see a, an aerial photograph I took as I was flying over uh, the Greenland ice sheet of lakes. Lakes are really important because lakes can drain. And what you see in the bottom left-hand corner is a photo I took of a couple of colleagues staring down essentially a plug hole uh, that developed uh, virtually instantaneously associated with one of these lakes uh, draining. So lakes fill in the summer and they drain as well, many of them. And a lot of my work has been uh, concerned with uh, field work, but also using satellite remote sensing. And we can see examples of both optical imagery in the, in the top, in the middle, in the middle of the uh, slide here, we can see those top two figures are the so-called optical images. These are uh, you, th these essentially look like uh, uh, you and I would see things in the, in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we've been using optical imagery, but also, as you see in the bottom two diagrams there, those are, those are radar images. So these are more uh, a recent satellite is using radar. And the great thing about radar is it sees through clouds. It sees in the dark, um, so you can use it in the winter. Um, and we use a combination of optical imagery and, and uh, radar imagery and develop algorithms for tracking uh, lakes. And we can map the, uh, the in increase and decrease in the size of lakes. Uh, and so on the top right-hand corner, that big diagram showing a part of the, the Greenland ice sheet, 
That is uh, one of our pieces of work, which has just used these uh, optical and, and satellite and SAR imagery, uh, radar imagery, to map the distribution of fast-draining lakes, slow-draining lakes, lakes that don't seem to drain at all but just freeze over in the winter, um, and, uh, and so on. And as I've said, the draining of lakes matters because it delivers water to the base of the of the uh, ice sheet, and that affects water pressures and the speed at which the glaciers move. So the bottom two diagrams there are just some outputs from a model. We use these, uh, we, we use these measurements uh, of, of water uh, forming on the surface of the ice sheet to um, input into, into numerical uh, models to identify patterns of water movement beneath the ice sheet um, as well. So I'm also, I've also been working in Antarctica recently. I've been um, three, three times now to uh, Antarctica. And here the story is about ice shelves. So ice shelves are these uh, floating parts of uh, the uh, Antarctica. They skirt around 75% of the coastline of Antarctica. And the, the important part, the important role of ice shelves is they provide a buttressing uh, effect. They hold back the, the potential much more rapid flow of the ice behind them, of the glaciers and the ice streams behind them. And if they break up, as uh, has been the case on a few ice shelves, the bottom two satellite images there show the dramatic catastrophic breakup of um, Larsen B ice shelf in, in 2002, which lost uh, over 3,000 kilometers squared of, of 220 meter thick ice. And um, there was a dramatic loss of ice shelves in, in that year. And the glaciers behind the, uh, the floating ice sped up as a result. So we're interested in uh, are other ice shelves going to be breaking up in the, in the future? Um, and one mechanism it's been hypothesized by which ice shelves break up is the associated with the melting um, and the buildup of water in ponds and lakes on those ice shelves, and then perhaps the draining of those lakes and the flowing of the water off uh, from those parts of the ice shelf. And this loading by water and then unloading of the water, we hypothesize contributes to, if that's happening in different places in different, to different amounts, that will cause the ice shelf to flex to bend and potentially fracture. So we went to the McMurdo ice shelf and the, the bottom graphs there just show a tiny bit of our data that we collected. We set up uh, pressure sensors to measure the level of water in, 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 uh, in lakes. And we set up GPSs uh, to measure the vertical movement of the ice shelf. And um, what it shows is that where we have uh, the filling and particularly the draining of, of, of a lake, we get a, um, an uplift of the surface in that location where the water is draining. Um, whereas a few hundred meters away, you do not get that vertical movement. So this is flexure. This is you know, horizontal variations in the vertical movement. This is bending and the bending moments there are sufficient to cause fracturing. So we've, we were the first to really measure uh, this flexure. We've been doing, we're doing work on a much more representative, much larger, uh, thicker ice shelf at the moment. And the, the, fi the figures on the, the right hand side show the George the Sixth ice shelf. Uh, we set up instruments there in 2019. Uh, we were unable to go back in 2020 due to COVID. We're due to go back again later this year to retrieve the data from our instruments. And we're slightly concerned that a, that a lot of our instruments may have got damaged because it happens that the last Austral summer was a particularly high melt uh, summer. And you can see that bottom right hand satellite image there shows a lot of water, more water than has ever been recorded on that ice shelf since satellites were measuring uh, that's since 1979. So an unprecedented high melt year uh, unfortunately coincides with a time where we were unable to get there for our and, and retrieve our instruments. This is some work I've been doing in, in the third pole in high mountain Asia. Uh, there are 95,000 uh, glaciers in high mountain A Asia, that's about a third of the global total. Uh, many are debris covered, they're covered in rocks and they're covered in sediments. Um, and until recently, it was thought that this, these rocks, these sediments actually provided a, a blanket, an insulating layer and, and protected the underlying ice from melting from the sun's rays and from the, from the war te warm temperatures. And what I've been working on is the role of ponds. You can see some photographs here of ponds 
uh, uh, small lakes uh, filling and draining on the surface of these uh, debris covered glaciers in, in Nepal in this case. And we've been using a combination of uh, field data, but also satellite data to map the ponds and to understand the sort of energy transfer within these ponds. And um, it turns out that these ponds are real hotspots. They absorb energy and then they transfer that energy in form of heat to the underlying uh, underlying ice. And if those lakes drain, they transfer this relatively warm water into the interior of the glaciers as well. So they're getting melt, they're melting from below. And we were able to calculate that over a 15 year period, the ponds in, uh, in, on five glaciers in the Langtang region contributed to about an eighth of all of the mass loss of, of, the, of the glaciers in that region. Okay, so that's it. Um, I just gave you a real brief flavour of uh, some of the work that I've been doing in, in the, the three poles, let's say, the North Pole and the South Pole and what sometimes is referred to as the Third Pole or High Mountain Asia. Um, I hope I've given you an insight into the importance of water uh, on ice. Um, the projections are that glaciers, that the Greenland ice sheet, and the Antarctic ice sheet are going to contribute, continue to contribute throughout the 21st century positively to sea level rise. Um, around 40 centimetres under a relatively optimistic scenario, but up to 80 centimetres of further sea level rise under a more pessimistic scenario. And the evidence suggests that we're currently following uh, that pessimistic scenario. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and hand over now to um, Ivan Scales. Thank you very much, Ian. So um, my title is about human geography and, and uh, conservation, but actually I want to make a little bit of a case for interdisciplinarity and uh, conservation. And, and of course, geographers in the audience will realise that one of the strengths of a geographical degree is precisely this grounding in both the, the natural and the social sciences. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about fieldwork I did a few years ago. It was funded by the Royal Geographical Society. And uh, I did some work with uh, Dan Fries, who may well be listening. He's uh, an alumnus of the college. He did his PhD here. And a few years ago, we went to a place called the Bay of Assassins, which is in southwest Madagascar. And you can see there that uh, Madagascar on, on left hand side has a, a fringe of mangrove going down its western coast. And it goes from the tropical humid uh, forest up in the northwest down to the drier areas, which is uh, where I've predominantly worked over the last 15, 20 years. And uh, the Bay of Assassins, you can see there on the right hand side, this is a, a Google Earth image. And you can see the green mangroves fringing um, the outside of the Bay of Assassins. And what you can do is well, you, you can use satellite imagery like the imagery from Google Earth, to measure forest cover change, mangrove cover change. But um, the simplest changes to detect are when forest is completely cleared, so when we have total deforestation. And um, that doesn't necessarily detect more cryptic degradation. So, for example, if the forest structure and composition is changing due to the way the forest is harvesting, the cover may look very similar. So you wouldn't be able to detect it necessarily through satellite imagery. And what you need to do is go on the ground and actually go and count and measure trees, which is what we did. So this is a, um, a photo of the Bay of Assassins. Uh, hopefully you get a sense of um, the dryness of it that I was talking about. This is a dryland area. It's a very flat region. And um, Madagascar has very high levels of poverty in general, but this is one of the poorest areas of Madagascar. The average income is considerably below $2 a day. And these are coastal communities that rely very heavily directly on the resources, both on the reefs, in the fisheries and in the mangroves. Now, what's interesting and one of the things I like to look at in my research is what happens when these sorts of remote communities uh, become incorporated into global commodity chains. And what's interesting is over the last decade, these very remote coastal communities have become incorporated into various fisheries and commodity chains of things like octopus, seaweed and sea cucumber, which are mostly being shipped to Southeast Asia. And so really the underlying question of my research is what happens as these communities become incorporated into these global commodity chains and how does that affect the way that they use resources? So what we did is, as I said, we, we went out there and uh, spent a couple of months in the mangroves of the Bay of Assassins and we counted and measured lots of trees. We measured harvesting rates 
And we also talked to people. We had participatory workshops and household interviews. And we were interested in, in how these households were using mangrove wood and mangrove forests. And here you see on the right-hand side is a, a traditional house. And the, the wood you can see being used here is mangrove wood. The image on the left is slightly different. And this is the interesting that we found when we were out there was that while there's, of course, a long history and tradition of using mangrove wood to build houses and to build fences, enclosures, to keep cattle, for example, that there was a new use of mangrove wood. What you can see here on the left-hand side is a kiln. It's about two by three meters for a sense of scale. So this is a, a, mostly a, a species of mangrove wood called rhizophora. Um, and usually some of the biggest species that occur in these mangroves. And what you can see there is it's filled with um, seashells. And what happens is that um, these seashells get burnt to reduce to produce a, a lime powder. And then what that lime powder does is, if you look on the bottom left-hand corner, is it gets used to then render houses. Now, actually, this practice of rendering houses with lime is, is a fairly new process and practice. And that's because actually it's very time consuming to do this. And normally most people don't bother. But what has happened is as incomes have started to increase for some households in relation to the, to the catching and exporting of octopus and seaweed and sea cucumber, a new economy has emerged where the wealthier households are able to pay others to produce this, what's called sukai. Sukai is the local name for this lime render that they use. And what's fascinating then is this, this lime render becomes both a way of making houses more durable, but also a, a status symbol to show that, that they are able to earn more income. So what's really interesting for me about this is it shows that resource use patterns change with changes in income, even in these remote rural communities. But also, it's not purely functional that there are cultural ideas of status that play into this. And I think what this shows very powerfully is that to understand this system, one needs to cut across disciplinary boundaries and across human geography and physical geography. We need remote sensing and ecological biogeographical, uh, biogeographical studies to measure mangroves and understand how they're changing ecologically. But also we need to go out there and talk to people in villages and find out why it is they're doing what they're doing. And I think for me, it's a powerful example of the, of the, the, the merits of trying to combine these techniques and, and going across the boundaries of physical and human geography. And I think what it also shows looking at policy implications and to show that, um, that the work that Ian, myself and Ron do very much is policy relevant, is that a lot of policy when it comes to managing natural resources tends to treat these systems as discrete. So we'll manage forests and we'll manage fisheries. But what our research has shown is actually the resource use is cut across these ecosystems. So it's no use managing fisheries better and more sustainably and improving the, the management of octopus or sea cucumber, for example, without then paying attention to the mangroves. Because it could be that you could be managing the fisheries perfectly sustainably, but if you don't manage the mangrove side of things and the wood side of things properly, then you can get a shift in the way that resources are used and some of these might or might not be sustainable. So kind of a real call for the integration of environmental management across ecosystems. And that's quite difficult because we tend to become disciplinary focused on particular ecosystems. And myself, my background was in the dry forest of Madagascar. I thought I was already a forest human geographer. But actually what this shows is that these things intersect and, and policy needs to be aware of that and historically really hasn't been. Um, right, thank you. That's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Ron, who's going to talk to us about some economic geography. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, as many of you may well remember, I'm really an economic geographer, and I've always been interested in how geography, regions, cities, towns, communities, and localities, how and why they matter for understanding, explaining, and indeed managing the economy. Now, traditionally, economists, uh, perhaps surprisingly, have ignored the geographies of the economy. For them, they're really just two levels, the macro national economy at one scale, and the micro economy of individual households and firms at the other. And what economic geographers have long labored to stress is that place and location actually do matter. And what is really interesting is over the last 20 or 30 years or so, a number of leading economists, uh, much to our annoyance in many ways, I should add, um, have discovered geography, um, including Paul Krugman, um, the American economist, who was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for economics in 2008 for his work in economic geography, um, which is great for economic geography, um, annoying for us economic geographers. 
Anyway, since then, um, interesting as well, the World Bank, the OECD, the IMF, and a variety of other international global policy bodies have all emphasized that geography matters for economic growth, economic development, and welfare. And I think one of the reasons for that is that something quite profound happened around about the late 70s, early 80s, a sort of shift, a hinge of history, if you like, between one post-war model of economic growth and development in which there was a progressive, slow uh, narrowing or convergence of social and geographical inequalities. So I had this period of places and people, in a sense, coming more and more together, mainly in the advanced economies. That's what I'm talking about here. Um, but since the sort of mid-80s, uh, something quite different has happened. And instead, what we've seen throughout the OECD countries, there's not an exception, is that, and that includes China now in these days, incidentally, is that there's increasing divergence or growth of inequalities between different social groups and between different geographical areas, different regions, different cities. And I think that's what's really activated the interest of economists and the interest of all these, these major global sort of policy bodies and think tanks in, in, in geography. And I've got two or three slides here to quickly um, illustrate this, which I've just put together for you. There's the first one, which is really looking at the, the uh, inequality as a measure of the coefficient of variation. It's a simple measure, but an effective one of the spread, if you like, in this case, of per capita incomes across both the US states, which of course are fairly large, and then more specifically for about 385, they call them metro areas. They're really cities down to sort of large towns. And you can see this sort of inflection or turnaround from convergence to divergence happening in the, the sort of early 80s onwards. And you can see exactly the same thing, another case I just picked out here for the UK, and again, you get that inflection around about the sort of 1980s, early 1980s, both for the big regions, there are 12 of those, Northeast, Southeast, et cetera, Wales, Scotland, and also for the 370 odd local authority districts, which span the whole of the country. So it doesn't really matter what scale you look at, you find the same pattern. As you move down the scale, as a good geographer would tell you, then you find more variation. So that's why the red curves are above the, the blue curves. Just a, a, an illustration of this, if you take two particular indicators, beloved of economists, productivity, uh, it's, not a pro, it's not an unproblematic notion of productivity, but we can't go into that here, or real wages, that's the actual wage def, def, deflated by cost of living. Um, and you've got different sorts of settlements here, London, then you've got the so-called core cities, there are 12 of those, uh, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, Liverpool, and so on then other cities, right down to small towns. And again, you find, if, this is all indexed back at 1971, is 100. So these are, if you like, the growth paths of these different types of town and city. You can see what's going on here, to both of these two indicators of an increasing sort of pulling away um, of certain areas, particularly London, of course, and we all know about London. Although if you go inside London, you find a divergence between some of the richer areas like Tower Hamlets, for example, and poorer areas like, say, Lewisham. You get the same divergence. So it's scale dependent, as a good geographer would expect, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, the same general trends are at work here of an increasing pulling away or pulling ahead, if you like, of certain places, which have managed, if you like, to get a, a foothold on the new sort of growth machine from the early 80s onwards, uh, new global and post-industrial growth machine, let's call it, whereas other places further down these graphs have been less successful at adapting and finding a new role, essentially. So these sort of graphs, and I've done the same thing for the United States and doing work for also for um, European Commission, uh, these sort of graphs just keep me repeating and repeating which suggests, of course, you've got quite some profound systemic processes that work here. And they include things like globalization, um, technological change, deregulation of markets, the rise of new international competitors, especially China and, and Southeast Asia, the financialization of social and economic life. Everything now is measured by the yardstick of, of finance, including 
sadly to say, the environment. That if, uh, the only thing that's of value in the environment is that it can be costed and, fi- and put into financial uh, metrics. Also, the increasing power, and this is very important actually, of these gigantic global uh, monopolistic corporations, not just the social media platforms, but the big pharma companies and, and big industrial companies as well. Some of these have their, their production is larger than many states and they exert enormous control. And they've also perfected the art of avoiding tax by moving their monies around the globe through different sorts of tax avoidance strategies and regimes. And it's estimated, for example, around about $800 billion a year is in tax that these companies avoid paying. And that's a huge amount of money that we put into social services, public infrastructures, and so on. So there's a real interesting argument to be had about whether we need to control and regulate some of these gigantic companies. The European Union, for example, has now exercised in a, in a major way about precisely that. So this is sort of the sort of work I've been doing of um, the last few years. Um, it's only one, one stream of work, but an important one. And I've had several major grants to do this. I'm currently working for the European Commission, uh, the OECD. I've done work for the UK Treasury and still doing work for the Treasury. BASE, that's the Department of Business uh, and Enterprise, and MHCLG, which is the Department of Local Communities uh, as well. And also working with colleagues in, uh, in Washington at the Brookings Institution, because this problem is, is really exercising both academics and policymakers, both the United States, throughout Europe um, and elsewhere. Now, why is all this important? Very, just very quickly, um, this unevenness, if you like, this pulling apart of the geographical economic landscape, it really means you, it, it, what it implies is lost growth and prosperity, both locally and nationally. It has negative impacts on the environment because growth is accumulating and building up in certain places with all sorts of problems of congestion, pollution, and so on. It it actually increases public spending on social and welfare support in those areas that are lagging behind, the so-called left-behind places. And, and this is extremely important, what it's done is fueled a new geography of social and political discontent, a new populism. And we find in the United States, for example, the election of Trump was very much on on the back of his promising and playing to the the depression in many parts of the United States and playing to the the idea, in fact, that he would bring jobs back. In the UK, um, it proved extremely important for the Brexit vote. The areas that tended to have the highest proportion of vote for Brexit were the areas which have been left behind. And, of course, the Hartley-Paul election only yesterday uh, proves that point yet again. There's a disgruntlement, and it's a valid disgruntlement. These places have been neglected and left behind for decades by parties of any uh, of all persuasions. So this new discourse has arrived on the political scene, of course, left behind places, building back better. Notice these things always involve three words. This is the, the Boris Johnson alliteration very often. And of course, this, this mantra of levelling up. And the government has committed around about 800 billion pounds in, in various forms of uh, projects and uh, schemes to try and help this levelling up process. And most recently, Joe Biden in the United States has committed $4 trillion to levelling up the United States. That is the biggest fiscal stimulus the United States has ever seen. And it's 17% of American GDP. Absolutely enormous. So this is a really vibrant area for geographers to get involved in the debates about what's happening and what can be done about it. And just finally, I think the pandemic has both exposed and intensified many of these social and geographic inequalities, as we know in Britain, with the the instance of infection and so on. And I think the time now is that we we actually need to rethink our economies and indeed our theories about them. And we need to build fairer, more sustainable, greener, net zero carbon economies, more resilient regions and cities, and more socially democratic forms of development. So I think we stand at a critical moment in the history of the global economy. But I think economic geographers are exceptionally well placed to help shape the conversation over what the future shape of that economy should be. And although I've talked about the economy here, just to reiterate what Ivan said, I think, you know, geography is a subject for integrating different perspectives and different spheres of interest. 
And I think the physical, the environmental, and the socioeconomic are so inextricably bound up that geography is really amazingly well placed to, to actually investigate and lead the, the debate about our current challenges. So hopefully we've actually conveyed to you the excitement of, of current day geography and the sort of things that we in St. Catharines teach our undergraduates. And I just think we've got a couple of minutes left when I might hand over to Ivan just to talk a little bit very quickly about admissions in geography in the college. So back to you, Ivan. As everything has been in the pandemic, uh, admissions has been challenging this year. <laughs> Uh, doubly so because we had a record number of applicants, uh, both for the college as a whole and also for geography. We had a ra record number of geographers. So geography is um, healthy, alive and strong and kicking, which is great news. And we will be welcoming eight new geographers in October, which we are very much looking forward to. And um, yeah, it was challenging. Uh, people in the audience might not know, but the university had to move all its admissions interviews online. Mm. And so everything as we're doing things on Zoom, everything went online. And uh, we were fortunate that actually we were able to, uh, Ian and I led the process, we were um, helped by Fran Moore um, and uh, Christine Batchelor in our interview process, and we were able to offer the same interview package. They had a physical geography interview where they did the usual. They were asked to interpret charts and maps and um, trying to test their data analysis skills. And then on the human geography front, we were able to email them reading in advance, half an hour in advance of the interview on socio-cultural issues. And they were able to read that and, and talk to us. So actually what was surprising was um, how smoothly it went. And uh, the university now is in discussions about how much of interviewing might be able to move online. So it's an interesting time. I think one of the most fascinating questions for me thinking about your, your work, Ron, is now, how much of these things economically, culturally, politically will carry on? Everybody's mm. talking about how this is going to revolutionize uh, everything. And I, I'm intrigued by how much actually is going to carry on, what will stick and what won't. And yeah. economically or environmentally, how much will we just bounce back to where we were? Are we actually going to pick back better um, or build forward better, I think, as you, as you like to say? Um, or actually, how much is the, the um, impetus to just go back to where we were before? And I, I think that's what worries me is it's, a, it's very tempting to go, right, well, let's go back to exactly what we were before, both environmentally, politically, economically. Let's just go back. Mm -hmm. and, as, and I think as we're all aware of all our, our, our talks have touched on, we're pro facing profound issues here, sustainability, economic inequality and climate change. Uh, and we can't just go back to where we were. So I think that's no, a... I, yeah, I, I think that you've hit a very interesting point, actually. I think cities, for example... Uh, I don't know if you've, you've been keeping up with the, the news about um, the use of cities in a post-COVID world. And I think there will be a change. Uh, I think there'll be a lot, a lot more people working from home. Yeah. There'll be a blending of home and, and office work uh, for those sorts of workers. Uh, if you work in a factory, you can't do that, obviously. Mm. But, and that has implications for the, the density of, of use of cities, um, for commuting, and therefore has environmental implications as well as social and economic. But I think leading back to Ian's point, I, I think, you know, now is a major opportunity, not just to go back to the, the status quo ex ante, as it were, what, what it was before, but really to say now we can build back or build forward greener and with our eye very much on, on trying to do what we can to mitigate the, the warming of the climate. Um, I mean, it, uh, I, I was a bit frightened by what Ian, sorry, what uh, Ian said, you know, about the, the, the rate at which, you know, the sea levels are rising, but we've got to do something. And I think now is an opportunity where we can say, you know, we've reached a point, don't you think, Ian, where we, yeah. we need to do something quite different? Yeah, I, I would reiterate um, that. I mean, I, I just focused on sea level um, because and, and, and the glaciers contribution, that's just one aspect of it, of course. But, mm. uh, you know, there's there's increased storms, uh, floods, droughts. Um, it, it It's really quite a catalogue of rather depressing news. Um, and uh, we... I have a question which, which, I, which we got from, um, fr from an audience member, which was uh, about, you know, how much longer have we got to, to save the planet? And my answer to that is always, it's, it's, it, it's not, not too late, and we need to have already started, of course, and we need to just do as much as we can now. Um, I, 
And, and the other statistics which, which uh, I found intriguing was that um, actually in terms of the global warming and the sort of climate, the impact of the sort of shutdown of the economy and, and, and the reduction in travel um, that that has uh, produced, uh, movement of goods, but also, of course, movement of people uh, for work, but also for leisure, has really had next to no impact on the global nice. climate. And the projections are that that's, it's, it's, it's really going to be absolutely negligible. Um, another statistic is that uh, the, the use of data centres and, and um, compute, computers now, a lot of which are, are, are used for streaming of uh, Netflix and, uh, and other, other channels. Or well, Bitcoin. Um, these these are now uh, the carbon footprint of these is is comparable to to the flying yeah. that uh, we all did prior to the pandemic. So you know we're we're still using energy, and um, so the importance of switching to carbon free, carbon neutral uh, energy sources is is really very very important. Yeah, but we we certainly need to embark in a major way on a transitional economy you know, to a greener economy. I mean, and it's not something, I mean, Trump used to sort of go on about the fact it was going to cost and destroy jobs and, and cost a huge amount of money. In fact, it will create jobs. Mm. It will destroy some jobs, clearly, you know, mm. but I think it actually has the opportunity to create far more many jobs. But um, unless we do something, I mean, we can't sort of simply carry on as we were before and expect future generations to pick up the tab. It may well be too late by that time anyway. I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned, we probably ought to wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but very, very quickly, I'm glad you mentioned the rise of populism um, uh, and you know this, this stemming out of, a, a, of growing inequalities between the regions between, um, because, and, and Trump as part of that. And of course, you mentioned that... Uh, that this will produce pollution in particular areas, but of course, a big impact, big thing that Trump did, and let's hope it never happens again, was the pulling out of the Paris yeah. um, Agreement. I mean, we need leadership from all the world's countries, particularly the powerful and the rich ones, yeah. like we've never had it before, to um, to, to to put together packages to, um, to to move to this new way of doing things. Mm. Yeah. Right. I, I, I'm conscious of the time we are yeah. we are yeah. chatting away. Yeah. It's been lovely to see you all, um, and uh, I think I'd like to hopefully speak on behalf of, of all of us to to say to the people in the audience to thank people for tuning in today, and yeah. we are really looking forward to being able to welcome you back in college sometime soon. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.